Hello, founders. Welcome to startups.com. We are live. A great show for you today. I am joined, as always, by my co host, Jen is here. And we have Justin. He is our guest founder and one of our community leaders and advisors here at startups.com. I'll let him introduce himself in just a moment. Before I continue, I wanted to do a quick shout out and say that we are startups.com and we are all about having these great conversations about what it means to be a founder. This startup podcast is going to be for you. We have something called the Startup Therapy Podcast, and we like to talk about all the things most founders don't always feel comfortable in talking about. The podcast is hosted by our CEO and our chief marketing officer, Ryan Rattan. And it's this no BS look in terms of what it takes to be a startup, all the life, the emotions, all that good stuff. Evolution of entry level workers, assuming everyone will leave you, like all these different topics. Make sure you check it out. Startup Therapy Podcast. I'd like to introduce our guest here today, Mr. Justin Ford. And I just want to encourage all of you who are in the audience that if you have a question for Justin or a question that comes up or any question whatsoever, we're going to prioritize that and we're just going to pick Justin's brain and we're going to talk and we're just going to get right into things, what it means to be a founder and help. As far as this community is concerned, we are an accelerator, so we want to help all the founders out there. Justin, welcome to the show. Tell everyone who you are, what you do. Thanks for having me on, Ed. Uh, pleasure to be here. So yeah, I'll just give a quick intro into kind of why I'm in the startup space and then some of my background here. So when I was younger, I started getting really invested in this idea of how a startup or a business can do a lot of good for the world. So it can theoretically take some massive real world problem and then solve it in a way where you're creating this business around it that's helping push the economy forward, creating new jobs, distributing wealth, all that fun stuff. Okay, uh, hang, so yeah. hang on a second. When you say when I was young, what are we talking about? Because you seem like a young yeah. guy. Was this like last I, I year? Yes. <laughs> uh, so this would have been when I was in university, which was 2015-ish. Okay, so great. Close Good to, to 10 know. Years. I just drink a lot of water. So I guess <laughs> still okay. look a bit younger. Keep doing me. what you're doing, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I started uh, wanting to work on some businesses. Was playing around in the entrepreneurial space kind of early on in 2018, 2019, but wasn't really getting my feet set on the ground anywhere. I knew I wanted to work in sports because I kind of saw this rising issue with human health in North America. And we thought that sports could be the big solution to that. Then shortly after that, the pandemic hit. So guy I was working with at the time was my today co-founder. Uh, we built this health screening app for sports clubs and leagues. Essentially, all these clubs were scared of getting sued if anyone caught COVID at one of their games. So we built out this pre-screening waiver signing contact tracing app for them. Timing was great. I, everyone needed an app like that. So it kind of blew up overnight. We scaled that to seven figures. Ultimately, it was always just going to be a temporary business for us because it, you know, COVID was temporary. So we started putting our eyes onto this kind of return to sports space, right? Mm. We saw that everyone was staying at home and this issue that we had identified even before the pandemic was getting worse and worse. And again, that is related to human health. So we wanted to do something that could help people live much healthier lives. So whether that's social health, physical health, mental health, like all those different things, we wanted to kind of package in one bundle. And we had this idea related to volleyball. So essentially, volleyball is pretty much the only lifelong co-ed team sport that there is. Volleyball and ultimate frisbee would maybe be the other one. Gotcha. More people play volleyball. So we thought, okay, if we can get everyone in North America playing volleyball once a week, we could drastically improve the average person's quality of life. So we launched this app to help people book volleyball games in their area, all drop in. We prioritize skill level. So we make it really easy for players to find other players of a similar level. We've now scaled this business up to seven figures in revenue. We are running close to around a hundred games per week in our kind of main city that we launched in Toronto. Uh, we've got about 30,000 players and we are scaling and launching into some other cities. And I guess the most important thing of all is it's an incredibly rewarding business to be operating because again, we're actually, I think, helping people live much healthier lives. And the things I hear, the stories I hear from our players, the friendships or relationships that we've helped uh, foster are what, what motivates us. Fantastic. All right. For all of you in the audience or anybody who's watching recording, feel free to pop in your question. I'm going to rip Justin with a few questions just to give us a little bit of context. Let's talk about 
sort of the main highlight stuff. You say that you're at seven figures of revenue, so that's awesome. Congratulations. Did you raise money? How much money did you raise? What's the financial picture? Yeah, so we we raised some friend and family rounds, and then we also self-funded with the money we made from our previous venture. That was enough for us to get to profitable with our current business. I'm potentially eyeing another raise right now, looking to start scaling into the States. But to be honest, it will depend on the market. Sure. Uh, it's a bit of a tough market right now. So we're thinking of maybe holding off until next year. Maybe we'll try to pull the trigger this year. The best part about that is you don't need to raise money. It would be nice to throw gasoline on the fire. But what you did is you met a need in the marketplace and you pretty much built something, it made money, and then you continue to iterate according to the needs in the marketplace. Who is technical? How did you build it? Give me the configuration of your team, co-founders, et cetera. Sure. So yeah, I did some programming. I, I, back in the day, I studied math in university before switching into business. When I launched this initial kind of venture in COVID, we actually just managed to bring on a, a developer who wanted to work on the, the problem with us, my co-founder and I. So we built that business with him. And then we used the money from that to be able to pay a team here. So while I can speak the language, I haven't coded in a while. Uh, and yeah. yeah, we just have a team doing that in-house. Okay. So that's really great. So one question I'm going to ask because a lot of our founders here at startups.com, they're not technical. If you had to give advice, let's establish this here. You are non-technical. You brought on technical people. You create a business that did million dollar plus in revenue. What is the secret? What would you advise non-technical founders to do if they're in the same spot? So, well, first off, the main piece of advice is get a technical co-founder. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It'll make your life a million times easier. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> well, I mean, when we launched this like COVID app back in the day of, it was, it was insane for us. Like I wasn't sleeping at all that time because like just the volume of customers we had coming on. I mean, I, we couldn't handle that. Our platform couldn't, it was a bit of a nightmare, but with that being said, generally, if you can find a good timing piece, it's generally a lot easier to make things happen. So we had, we used COVID for two of our big timing pieces, right? We saw when COVID happened, people will need a health screening app. And then we saw at the tail end of it, people will want to get out and socialize there's always going to be something happen and happening in nearly every industry. So identifying what those trends are and then kind of looking into the direction that your industry is going, that will make your life a million times easier. I know startup investors like to say team and timing are the two big things they look for. Realistically, good teams are constantly identifying and executing on timing trends. It just comes down to being very cerebral with what's happening in the different spaces that you might want to be working in and executing on, on helping, I guess, move them along in the direction they're going. Sure. That doesn't answer the question, though. Let's get a little more explicit. We have non-technical founders. Let's just take for granted they're able to see that opportunity get in there. But how did you get to the point where you got somebody technical, a developer, you've been doing it and you haven't lost your shirt. You're not losing your mind. You're not frustrated with like a developer team in India or someone that's ripping you off because this story happens over and over and over again. How did you manage to pull it off? Yeah. So I put some of my money up like right out front. And at one point, like, I mean, I, I got down to $500 in the bank at one point and our company was 15 K in debt. Uh, <laughs> okay. So yeah, don't like, don't do that. <laughs> Stupid of me. I was told by my early, I guess, early, like people in the startup community that I spoke with, I was kind of told like, oh, just, you know, just build something, get it out there, show investors that it can make money and then they'll invest in your product. So I put something out there. I showed investors it could make money, but it was, I mean, it was a shit product because it was our first version, right? Yeah. We were just held up by an amazing timing trend, but we were having like massive churn there because we were working our you know, day in, day out to improve our scalability issues. And investors saw that churn, right? And they're like, I'm not going to invest in a product with this much churn. So we couldn't raise any money. Right? That was ultimately, and, and to be fair, I mean, it's probably better that we didn't for that business because it wasn't something I really wanted to do in the long term. But, but again, I put myself in a bad situation because I started with the amount of resources that you would really need to get a product into market, not the amount that you would need to get product market fit. And sure. generally getting to market is actually uh, not that difficult, whereas getting to product market fit is extremely difficult. Those are massive gaps. I think a lot of founders start with the resources required to get a product in market, and then they end up in this product market fit quagmire. It's kind of what you mentioned, Ed, where they have a product live, but it hasn't been iterated on enough. It hasn't had enough customers come through and stress test it to get to a point where it's really amazing. So that's why I generally recommend almost all founders either, if you have an insane network and you can set up 50 investor meetings over a week, try to raise before you do anything. Otherwise, try to start with someone technical who is really willing to 
get nitty and gritty and, and make sure that you have a good product that can grow on its own. And that was what you were able to do. You were able to find a technical person that wanted to get nitty and gritty, at least in the early stages. Yes. And that case is, I mean, it's hard to find good people. It's very difficult. So that's another thing that we've made some mistakes with hiring developers in the past. doesn't feel good. You might've heard the saying, hire slow, fire fast. I would echo that. Absolutely. 100%. I've met with CEOs, huge CEOs, people who are absolutely just on top of their game. And when I ask them, what's the one piece of advice when you're at that stage and you've got money and you've got revenue, that's the most common thing hire slow fire quick and i live by that as well let's talk about launching you get a product out there and then you talk about that quagmire so how did you get to the point where product market fit you got thirty thousand people on board with your app right now which is amazing i love the fact that you are really taking on a specific city, a location, and then you can show how you've done that. And you can tell investors, okay, we can go to other cities like pouring gasoline on the fire. What was the process that you went from, okay, it works, someone's going to pay us, to now 30,000 people are on board? How did you get there? So yeah, it, it goes back to that term I used earlier of being cerebral. I, I think for me, that is one of my mantras and kind of everything we do, where we're trying to operate as closely to the truth or as closely to reality as we possibly can. I think in general, it's really easy to kind of convince yourself that things are one way, oftentimes like whatever way is most convenient for you, when the reality can oftentimes be pretty different. So early on, objectively, your, your product is probably going to suck, right? If it's not something that is taking over the world overnight, it's probably not going to be a great product. And being real about how and why it's not is how you can then start iterating on it and making it better. So for us early on, like to give you an example. So, so right now when you join Javelin, we have a bunch of different tiers of skill levels. So we have beginner direct training sessions, which teach people how to uh, play volleyball. Then we have rec games, high rec, intermediate, high intermediate, advanced. Our rec games are just for fun. Anyone can play and join. But as you go higher than that, we have a tryout system where okay. if you're not playing at the level of the game that you're at, you could fail tryouts and then you can't book at that level again for the next X days or X months. We okay, also have quiz that players have to pass. Hang on a sec. Let's let's yeah. stop here for a second. How much volleyball do you play? Well, when we first launched, I was playing nearly every day. <laughs> and then my ankles and knees started going. So I'm playing once a week now. Okay. But were you a volleyball fan? Did you play competitively before? Yeah. What's your background in volleyball? Yeah. So I played growing up. Um, gotcha. I didn't play competitively though. And that's why I fit this kind of weird middle ground where I was too good to play with people who didn't really play volleyball, but I wasn't good enough to play with the best players. Volleyball is a rally sport. And in the category of rally sports, skill level is more important than other sport categories because players need to be on a similar level for rallies to take place. We kind of identified that early on as a big problem that we wanted to build towards, but we just had to slowly find out what worked for skill level. Okay. So that's, I want to point this out you really got nitty gritty and you went and solved the problems for the people playing volleyball. You experienced a bit of it before and that's how you came up with this system of tryouts and the recreational, et cetera. Okay, so I think that's gonna be one big secret that I want all founders listening to this to take away is that Justin really went in there and worked with the problems, understood, gained some insight. I have no idea what a rally sport is. That just is total French to me. But because Justin knows that, he can adjust his product offering and build from there. All right, first phase done. You got that onboarding process, which is going to be important. Then what other things did you do to get to product market fit? Yeah, so fundamentally, we're a consumer company, which means we kind of play by different rules than I think a typical B2B company would. So when we were initially launching, we used some paid, for example, right, just to get our name out there. Uh, we worked with some podcasts. We would post on different social media pages. We would work with different courts to get our name out there. We did that for about the first year to kind of build the initial player base. And because again, our product was bad initially. Like it, it was a legitimately bad product. I can't sure. stress it enough. It's just people were desperate to do something after COVID that they were okay with playing in our bad volleyball games because it's better than nothing. I love it. So we, we spent, yeah, we spent that time kind of figuring things out. And then eventually we got to the point where kind of word of mouth took over. Right. We no longer needed to be using pretty much any marketing. This was again at, at the at about about eight, nine months of operations. So we could turn off all of our paid, uh, start transitioning into more long-term marketing. For us, that was really the sign that we kind of had found that product market fit is we had that sticky player base who were also telling other people about them. 
about 100 percent. let's let's pause here for a moment and and yeah. break this apart for all the founders listening in the beginning i always say you should never pay for users flat out don't pay for users unless you are testing users unless you're testing messaging and that's what you did so you use different forms of acquisition you start off with a little bit of paid you got the players to come on board the initial early adopters but your product fundamentally has got network effects built in the more people that use the product the better product's going to be and because you did that and you optimize for that eventually it takes on a life of its own and people are referring other people because i'm going to guess because it's a rally sport it's a team sport co-ed hey you should join this join our game etc and that's how you found that sweet spot and things start taking off on their own how'd i do that was very good Okay. And yeah, it was actually one feature that allowed us to find product market fit, but that was a feature where we started, it started breaking once a lot of people started using it. And we actually still have some headaches around it, but it was this auto sign up feature. Okay. Um, so essentially all of our games are weekly games. They're all weekly volleyball games, right? We'll have like, for example, a Friday intermediate eight to 10 PM game. Uh, we turned on, we created this auto sign up feature where someone could turn it on to automatically add them each week. And then they could cancel it at any time and, you know, cancel their attendance whenever. But we just wanted to do this just to make sign up easy for players each week. Oh, yeah. And we're like, if you know, it'll maybe turn volleyball into your Friday night thing. You turn it on and then, oh, I play volleyball on Fridays. The unintended benefit is that it also made it so that everyone else at the game was regulars. And that's really the piece that players kind of fell in love with is nice. on the second game when they came back, they would see all the same faces from the week before or a lot of them. I mean, to, to date, I think about 93% of players at the average Javelin game are regulars. Wow. Where you go to a game and you see the same people each week and you create these really great relationships from just playing volleyball with these same people every week. And uh, that for us was actually what allowed us to find uh, the really crazy stickiness that you need for, for PMF. Okay. And that stickiness came... This is the lesson for everybody watching. That stickiness came from removing friction. So you've got the whole volleyball thing, you know, inside the heads of volleyball player. I'm pulling out the principles. If you can make something less friction e, there's less friction in it, where it's an automatic sign up and you start creating those network effects, it becomes habitual for them saying, this is my Friday thing. You're changing the behavior and then you're building relationships and therefore People keep wanting to come out. You see someone that you know, I want to keep coming out to this. There's community, your tribe. All that stickiness came because you removed friction to get to that stickiness. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. Actually, there's kind of two points I have around that. So in terms of behavior changing, this is actually, because a lot of people, when I say we do volleyball, they assume we do like beach volleyball, but we actually almost exclusively do indoor. Mm -hmm. One of the big reasons for that is people are used to paying when they go to an indoor volleyball game, right? Gotcha. You much always have to pay when you play indoor. So that behavior change isn't that different because we're just organizing the indoor game for people. They're still, you know, I mean, they're going to be paying regardless. So there's not as much actual hesitancy or behavior change that you would expect to need for, for building a, a drop-in volleyball platform. Uh, and then the second piece around friction is the way we look at it is we actually use a ton of onboarding friction. And then after someone's onboarded and gone to a game, we try to take it all away. Nice. So, the point of the onboarding friction is we're fundamentally connecting people in person at a sport, right? I'm, I'm not like Amazon where I want someone to order a volleyball game on their couch and then it arrives the next morning at their doorstep. <laughs> sure. So we want to make sure we have, first off, very high intent users who really, really want to play volleyball, but also we want to keep them safe. So I make all of my players download an app and then verify both their email and their phone number. Right? Nice. So we have very high... Uh, confidence that all of our accounts are actual real people on our platform who are, you know, going out to games, seeing where people are playing volleyball, chatting with other players. And then after they've kind of done all that, then it's like, all right, here, you're in, you're good. You can just play consistently at whatever game you want. The auto sign up now works for you. Let me pull out the principle here as well. What Justin's explaining is the ideal customer profile is someone who is committed, who is going to build community. And we call it being a dictator at the door and then democratic on the dance floor. Meaning let's create that friction so that someone really has to want it to get in, but then just all bets are off. And I, I'm gonna share a similar story. When I launched an ed tech platform, we knew everybody was going to want to sign up because of our value proposition, but we need to make sure, and someone warned us, they said, your first cohort needs to be quality. And so we pinched off the cohort and we said, you have to go through three interviews. You have to already be, an executive VP or a director or a manager or a C-suite at some level so we could present 
that initial customer profile to the ideal customer profile and slowly expand from there. We got all the kinks out and we established a level of quality where people looked at us and they said, this is a quality product because look at the users. And that's going to be the same thing that's happening that someone shows up to a Javelin game. They're like, wow, everybody has been vetted. I feel safe. I appreciate it. And therefore, they're not going to want to go to some drop-in game. They're not going to want to go to meetup. They're not going to want to do all this other stuff. You've created a completely new environment and that set of behaviors that really helps solves the pain points that your volleyball players have experienced. Yeah, actually something really cool kind of related to that is you, you might've heard this term culture eats strategy for breakfast. 100%. It generally applies to businesses with this idea that businesses with good culture will outperform businesses with good strategy. One thing that I think a lot of people don't always appreciate is how impactful culture can be in almost any kind of group of individuals. So one thing that we lean a lot into is trying to set up good culture at our volleyball games. And we do this through a number of different ways, like one of which is just being very clear that, you know, we expect players to help facilitate fun games, safe games, and positive experiences, positive environments. And then another thing that we've done that actually helped the overall quality of our games a lot is when it comes to our tryouts and uh, rating players, we overemphasize skills like passing or setting, right? Skills that are essentially helping giving your teammates good balls to play with. Gotcha. Over a skill like hitting a volleyball, right? Nice. Which I think both people have a tendency of caring a lot about. And this allows our games to be essentially a lot more fun because the ball stays in the air longer. You get more touches in a rally. And just, yeah, again, small emphasize, emphases like that make a big difference as they cascade into the community. Everyone embraces them. And overall, things just get a lot uh, better for all, all of your members. You use technology to guide user behavior, which helps with the experience, which helps with culture, which helps with network effects. I love it. I'm curious. A lot of founders would be tempted to go and do what you did for every sport, not focus just on volleyball. Let me just point out a few things for everybody who's listening. Mark Zuckerberg, when he did Facebook, everyone said, oh, Facebook is a way to meet new people. He was like, no, it is not. Absolutely not. He said, Facebook is a way to help you organize the people you already know and have better relationships with them. It wasn't about meeting new people. So here, what we're doing, and that's what Justin just described, is people already paying. They already have the experience. We're just making it better, moving the friction of what they already do. Fantastic. Step one. Step two, Mark Zuckerberg says, we are not going to allow anybody to use Facebook unless they have a Harvard email address. Let's dominate Harvard. Let's do Stanford. And a lot of founders, they go, oh, that's not big enough. That's not going to scale. They'd rather go and get their aunts and uncles and all the different schools, all the different organizations. I'm sure you were tempted, or maybe some people have asked you, why volleyball? I know the answer from a startup principle, but walk us through your decision and how that's affected you in staying in volleyball. Definitely. And I have a lot of thoughts around this. Um, so first off, we have tested a ton of other sports. The numbers behind volleyball blew them all out of the water. And the big reason for that actually goes back to that rally sport term I use. So other rally sports would be things like tennis, ping pong, badminton, anytime rallies take place between two players. Most rally sports, again, skill level is really important because if players aren't on a similar level, rallies can't take place. Mm. However, most rally sports only have two to four players, right? Gotcha. Volleyball has 12, right? 12 on a court. Getting 12 volleyball players of a similar skill level together is extremely difficult. Mm. So because we built out a platform that makes that exceptionally easy, I mean, we built a viral sticky platform that is pretty easy to grow in new cities even, which I mean, most networks tend to be pretty difficult to do that for. When it comes to other sports, we could fork off, I think, a different app, right? And solve all the sports specific nuances of, of those other sports, because every sport does have their own nuances. People in the sports are looking for different things. And that could be a long-term play we take. Another potentially exciting long-term play we have that we're actually currently executing on is we're, we have a leaderboard for like different teams on our platform. Because we've actually not only do drop in volleyball, we have expanded into tournaments, leagues, training sessions. So all the teams that compete on our, pla on our platform, we have leaderboards for based on their performance. And I think in the long term, we can eventually, you know, have kind of a high certainty on where the best teams in each city are, where and when they're playing, and then eventually start selling streaming and licensing rights to these games. This is a sense of almost like a democratized professional volleyball league where yeah. anyone can put together a team, compete in their city and potentially win their way to you know, competing on uh, 
on their local television. I think it's a very cool business there. And uh, we, we think it's a cool opportunity because volleyball and the pro space, at least, is, is still relatively uncharted in North America. It's a massive TAM in the sense that you've got so many people who are exposed to volleyball, know how to play volleyball. I remember, like, that's just a module that you did in phys ed during junior high, high school. A lot of fun when it works. And you're picking a very difficult problem that other people don't want to look at. But then you could ride that tab because all volleyball has to do, like you just have to have a Caitlin Clark moment for WNBA, right? You just need that one moment and then you're there right on the ground floor and then you're writing your own checks. You got your blank check, pretty much that's what it is. So I really appreciate the way that you niched yourself. And this is the principle. I want everybody to listen. The riches are in the niches in the beginning. Go to a niche and then expand from there. You have to expand from there once you've dominated that niche and you're going to generalize, but the riches are in the niches. It's fantastic. Okay. So, but I'm, I'm curious because I have contacts in the ultimate Frisbee space. I would think that ultimate, the field version, not disc golf, it's a completely different thing, would sort of lend itself to what you're building. Am I wrong? So yes. And we actually did test ultimate issue with ultimate. Well, there's a few potential issues. First off, us being in Canada, we get a ton of seasonality. So people would play ultimate outside in the summer and then move inside in the winter. The second issue, and this is actually another issue similar to basketball, is most ultimate players aren't really willing to pay for ultimate. Similar with basketball, most basketball players aren't really willing to pay for basketball. They kind of view them as sports that should be free. Gotcha. Every volleyball player is willing to pay for volleyball. So I love it. It's actually a much bigger potential business when it comes to just the drop-in space. I love how much customer discovery that you've done. Huge amounts. When you say cerebral, you have thought it through and you are a thought leader in that space. That's fantastic. Let me take a little bit of a separate fork in this conversation. Talk to me about your friends, family, and associates raise. How much, if you can share, or just in general figures, did you raise and how did you go about doing it? Because a lot of our founders, they need to do that before going to VC. I'm going to talk about VC and your experience with that in just a moment, but FFA. Yeah. Um, so essentially, I mean, I knew some people in my immediate network who had some money. I, I was building early on though, and we kind of thought we didn't really need much external funding. So we were just building for a while. I got, we started, I don't know. I think it was when we hit like six figures. I was talking to some investors and uh, I had someone give me a yes uh, in 2022, late 2022. At that point, I'm, instead of taking their money, I just kind of went internal and I said, all right, so we got a yes from these like investors. Would you be interested in investing instead? And uh, they kind of said yes. So I went with their money instead because fundamentally, I think it's better to support the people close to you. That was kind of how we made that decision. In terms of actually like talking to these investors, essentially what the strategy was is reach out to a lot of founders on LinkedIn or otherwise, do some intro calls with them, see if they'd be willing to intro me to anyone in their network. And I mean, you got to do that a ton, like reach out to hundreds, thousands of people to eventually start getting enough investor intros to actually start moving the needle in terms of meeting volume. It was again, enough for us to get to profitable and a decent size in Toronto and for us to expand outside of that, I might need some more money. So, and yeah, the range is in, is in the six figure range, but we don't have the official announcement live there. Let's talk about your experience because I remember working with you a couple of years ago. I mean, we've known each other for a bit now, a hot yeah. minute. And we were going back and forth on your pitch deck. Like you really push that pitch deck in all the meetings. What's the secret, do you think, in terms of positioning yourself in front of investors, pitch decks? Like what were all the tools that you use and what are some best practices founders should learn from you? I think it depends. You kind of want to position yourself as a business founder or as a product founder. Okay. Right? And I generally would encourage people to go extreme in one direction rather than be trying to be both. So business founders are people who are essentially are trying to come off extremely organized and well-connected. Usually a business founder would have a previous exit. So if, if that's not you, just keep this in mind. It can be really tough to, to go that route. Yep. Um, and essentially off of just an idea and off of a network, typically a business founder can raise uh, or raise a substantial chunk of money, right? Typically what that looks like is using their network again to structure a ton of meetings over a very tight schedule. They take calls with those VCs, the VCs after the call reach out to their other VC friends and their other VC friends all say, oh, I'm talking to that individual too. And they start feeling really nervous. Like, oh, if I don't invest in them, then I'm going to lose this opportunity. So then they quickly write them a term sheet. The business founder then 
typically will have a very clean data room. They'll typically have a process, right? And try to take investors through that process very quickly. It's actually very similar to dating. <laughs> where you're just like, <laughs> go on as many dates as you can and just keep trying to schedule the next date and come across <laughs> as confident, but not overly pushy, stuff like that, right? Okay. In terms of the consumer founder, typically what you're trying to look at, like it's very busy, which is kind of funny where it's like, <laughs> You get some general deck, right? That just goes over, like, look at how fast we're growing. Look at how amazing our product is, how much our users love it. Totally. And it's just an intro deck and you just circle that to as many investors as you can. And then investors are curious about this and they'll reach out to you and you say, oh, sorry, I'm busy this month. Can we talk like this week and this next month? And gotcha. hopefully you can book a bunch of investors into that week and yes. you kind of end up running a similar process. But it's more, again, centered around your customers and your product than it is around things like a data room or your financial model or anything like that. Let's explain this in a few different terms here. When you're talking about a business founder, what investors are looking for is the exceptional founder. So if you've had a previous exit and you took something unicorn, yes, Elon Musk is one of those founders. He raised $6 billion for XAI and it's not even a thing yet. He just puts it out there and says, I'm raising for this. Jeff Bezos came to me and said, Ed, invest in my next startup. I have no idea what it is, but it'll be good. I would write him a check, right? Who's not gonna write them a check? And if you've got that pedigree, you can definitely become that exceptional founder because investors believe that you can figure it out. And every investor is going to say, your first idea, your first version is going to be wrong. It's going to be janky, but get it out there. And I trust that you're going to figure out. Now, what happens if you don't have that pedigree behind you, which is most founders, that includes me right in the beginning. Now, since I've developed a reputation and I've got investors that I can contact and say, hey, I want you to take a look at this new venture, and they're always going to be open. They're always going to take my meeting because I have a track record. But before, I had to focus on product, as Justin talked about, but more so traction. You either have lots of traction going in or you're an exceptional founder. And if you are the type of founder, because you got so much traction, you're busy. I can't take this meeting. We're only going to raise in a certain window. Look at all the users and you're communicating. That's what's going to create the FOMO as well because we invest in diamonds in the rough. We're looking for those founders that find that obscure opportunity that no one's looking at. Underserved, underrepresented, underestimated. And I think that's where volleyball falls into it, the whole equation. I love the concept of it because it's like you have no idea how many people play volleyball on a casual basis and how hard of a problem this is. That's why competition is going to come and solve it. Yeah. I mean, if you go into the actual numbers and Google them, I think you'd be surprised how many people play it globally. And it comes back to the fact that it's a lifelong co-ed sport, right? Mm -hmm. There aren't many sports in that category. A lot of the sports that people think are the really big ones are actually mostly just played by youths. So a lot of the adult sports haven't really been built for yet. And we think this is a really cool opportunity to show people that you can build something really big and really impactful in the adult space. Okay. Now tell me about your experience because I know you did this. I remember you're taking meetings with legitimate VCs. You went around. What was that experience like? Even though you decided not to raise that way, it didn't pan out and probably for the better. What was that experience? What advice would you give other founders that want to contact institutional capital? Yeah. Again, calendar density is, is probably the most important part of that, which is, is an unfortunate piece to the industry, I think. Outside of that, a raised conversation is very interesting. So typically what the process looks like is you uh, inquire about an intro or so you can, here, okay, here's, here's what I did. So I got sales, LinkedIn sales navigator. I would type in founders names into that. And then I had this big list of like hundred, 200, however many VCs that I was hoping to chat with. And I would see if they have any connections with anyone at those VCs. And then I'd reach out to the founder and say, Hey, would you happen to know any of these individuals well enough for an intro? Nice. They would maybe say yes. Usually what they'd say, no, it's just a random connection. Business potential business in there. If anyone can fix that with intros, everyone, it's actually a common thing for people to be working on, but oh yeah. anyway, they'd reach out to the actual investor. So they'd forward this investor, a blurb from us. That blurb is so important. A lot of people talk about the pitch deck being important, but that intro blurb is probably more important. Huge, it's, huge. The investor would read through it and just say, yeah, I'm interested. No, I'm not. Uh, it used to be more about market size back then. Like you would just convince investors hey, this is a big market and hey, I can raise a lot of money. And if I keep raising money in a big market, eventually I'll win it. These days, it's more about, hey, I'm building a good business with good fundamentals. Here are our revenue numbers, traction, all this stuff. So anyway, that intro will get you the call. Um, 
Again, try to schedule all these meetings over a tight window. You can then send over an intro deck before the actual meeting. Just say, hey, just go through this quickly so we can get into a deeper conversation during the actual call. Usually they don't, <laughs> but regardless... <laughs> You jump yep. on the call and I got some, I've got some interesting advice on how to handle these calls. It did work, but keep, take this with a grain of salt is like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go too far down this route, but I know a lot of the founders who do, and it works extremely well for them where they follow this advice around things like, you know, treat investors like they're subhuman, never show up <laughs> to an investor call on time, never uh... respond back within 24 hours, never send a follow-up, like stuff like that, where you're just trying to show them so much that you don't need them. I don't, again, this has worked for other people. People. There is some fundamental premise, though, to coming across on those calls as if you're talking to a lot of people. Coming across kind of tired with your pitch really structured, being able to just get through points quickly, talking matter-of-factly, not being too emotional in the call, and then paying a lot of attention to the way the investor reacts during the call will actually teach you a lot about what to say during your next ones, right? You'll say something, right? Like a big common question is in the long term, what do you want to do? And they're all looking for me to say, oh, I'm going to launch into every sport and take over every sport. Whereas I probably actually am more excited about pro volleyball. So you kind of got to figure out what to say there. That was what my experience was like. Um, it is tough, right? Raising, I think a lot of founders will say it's the hardest thing you'll probably ever do. And the idea is if you can get through that, then any other business problem you might experience is going to be easy for you. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do if you have not done the work up to that point in time. Back then, you even admitted you were talking to VCs and investors when you were still looking at a half-baked potato. I guarantee your conversations with investors, if you keep going on the directory that you're on right now, Justin, is going to be fundamentally a lot easier than before, they're most likely going to be contacting you because even if you look, I was just looking, I didn't even realize this, but you've got press, like you've got social proof here, Yahoo Finance, Startup Toronto here, Financial Times, National Post, like those are legitimate social proof markers that investors look at, analysts, etc. I'm sure you're gaining a lot more momentum now in those investor conversations because you have a product that's working. And actually, that's a good point is... um. The next thing we're kind of working on is a big PR strategy. So I'm currently reaching out to a ton of different journalists. Um, run clubs were huge in the summer up here in Toronto. And I'm trying to pitch an angle of people kind of transitioning from run clubs as their healthy social activity into volleyball as we move into winter. And as you know, you have to do something indoors. So yeah, having some kind of PR can go a long way. Your success may vary though. Because if, if you're just not in an area where there's a hot story going around, it, it will be hard to get reporters to talk about it. And that's actually very similar with raising money is yeah you need to be kind of on topic if or, or on trend if you want it to be easy sure right now ai is sucking all the oxygen out of the room so that's mm -hmm. going to be a window but that ultimately that window is going to pass the bubble is going to burst but let me give some advice to the founders who are going to be listening to this we're on the call right now i have never raised i've raised nine figures i have never raised money on a cold call not once Lord knows I have tried and the best have come from referrals, just like Justin was talking about, hey, can you refer me? Do you know these people? Things of that nature, those types of techniques. Investors will find you on three dimensions. The first one being if you already got funded, if you got press, you got news. We have a founder right now and he just won $25,000 for a pitch competition, got on a very popular podcast and his life went nuts. The inbound inquiries of follow on investment just for $25,000 because he got that press with that well-known investor that opened up doors for him. If you've done a funding round, you put it on a crunch base and you say, great, we did this. People are going to find out and they're going to contact you and say, Hey, can we follow on with this? If you get in a database, when I interviewed down at Y Combinator and then tech stars, I don't know what happened, but you go out in this database and they must have put a note in there. And all these people started contacting me saying, hey, saw you in this database and saw that you went, you know, interviewed down at Y Combinator, saw that your startup was promising. How's it going? They were following up with me like years after, even tech stars and Y Combinator. So if you're in that database and you've already got success in terms of raising capital or you've got that press, that's going to work well for you. The second way is industry publications and news. If you can get into an industry publication, look at Javelin Sports. It's taking the world by storm. Like this is the app that nobody ever thought of. Have you thought of playing volleyball? That's where investors send their associates, their scouts to analyze that. And they will contact you. They'll say, we saw your article in this. We saw that this national magazine or this conference or this trade publication is talking about you. Do you need investment? That's the second way. And the third way, the best way is, and it's the third best way, 
is word of mouth referrals or warm referrals. And that's the reason you got to be working your network and you have to constantly be developing those relationships. If you're a founder out there and you don't know how to develop relationships, you don't know how to stay in touch and keep best investors posted or ask, who else do you think I should talk to? You're not going to build your network. It's going to be very difficult because investors want to see you continue to raise. They want to know that you can network and present to future employees and talk to other investors. They want to see that you're the type of founder that can talk and present. And that's one thing that I really appreciate about you, Justin. We've had conversations you know, back and forth is how articulate you are, how thoughtful you are. You tell me things that give me novel insight. You say, it's a rally sport. And I'm thinking rally type thing. And then you explain to me, oh, that makes so much sense. You give me information like this is a lifelong co-ed sport. Never thought about that. And that's the type of impression that you give. And what founders have to do is give off that same executive presence to show that you've got that swagger, that intelligence that you can figure out your market. What do you think? I think the standard that founders should hold themselves to is, is to be the LeBron James or whatever your favorite athlete is of your space, right? Be kind of the one person in your industry that knows as much as you do, or you are more specifically your team. Like, mm-hmm. can you be by far the best team in your space? And I think if you hold yourself to that standard, you, I don't know if you'll necessarily achieve it. It's obviously a lofty goal, but I think you will achieve great heights when it comes to not trying to look for other people to answers, but to understanding that you need to be the one finding the answers and that that will allow you to get much deeper with actually building cool, new, innovative uh, products. You're relentlessly resourceful. You're willing to learn. Get out there. Jen, do we have any questions that came through or are we good? No questions, unfortunately. Okay. Well, if you're in the audience and you have some questions, if not, I'm going to rip a few more questions to Justin. Make sure we only got 10 more minutes to answer those questions. But Justin, back to you. What is the number one piece of advice that you give? Here's the setup. I have got your family hostage. I'm holding them by by gunpoint. And I'm saying you got to give the founders here at startups.com one enduring piece of advice that haunts them with such value, then I'm going to release your family. What's the one piece of advice that you would give? So I have, um, I have today kind of spoken about some of the different pieces of advice that I think are really important for, for people to, to know things like being cerebral or things like having a tech co-founder, <laughs> stuff like that. Something deeper, I guess, that, that I've been thinking about a lot recently is understanding the way that not only kind of industries can change, right? Similarly to how we were identifying different timing trends around sports, but how kind of the culture and the, of the society that you're in can change. Um, I I might be a little bit of an optimist, but I, I do think we are moving into a new era of startups. And I think kind of what worked in the past won't necessarily work as well in the future. Agreed. So I'm starting to really like to conceptualize startups as, as having a few key points to them. That's there's some major problem that some extreme individuals are delivering an exceptional solution to. I think that if you can really distill it down and into making sure you're you're covering those three pieces, then you should be good. You should be able to move into this again hopeful future where we're having businesses that are focusing on massive problems that humans are facing and are solving them in for-profit ways that are helping raise all boats. I think you'll be really well suited to, to play in that environment if that's what your business looks like. I think we had a Q&A. Jen, is that a legit question coming through? There is a legit question. It says, when cold emailing VCs or DMing on LinkedIn, can you please expand on the blurb? Do you include executive summary on that first contact or pitch deck or both? Yes, definitely. So this is actually very difficult because uh, it needs to be enticing and it needs to be extremely short. VCs will just skim through this. So using kind of common tricks, like a lot of spaces, right? Talking in one line, stuff like that, like what you'd see in a LinkedIn post to catch someone's attention or a Twitter post, depending on what you like to use. So that goes a long way. But in terms of the actual content, again, when I was doing this, it was mostly market size that I had to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, here's this insane market size. Here's this, um, why it's going to grow. I think these days, if you can get a timing piece around AI, that will catch a lot of VCs' attention. So it kind of comes down to looking through Twitter at what VCs are talking about in your industry. So they could be talking about, yeah, essentially, like, like look for the trends that they're already cognizant of and then tell them kind of what they want to hear in that blurb. It's very common once one kind of gets on an idea for them to all start talking about it. So if you can find those keywords and phrases and make sure they're very 
obvious and at the top, that can go a long way. Right now, I think timing again around AI is huge. Traction is big, but traction is actually starting to, even that is getting deeper where it used to just be revenue, but now things like revenue retention is I think one of the next hot things for VCs. So if you can put that in there, that's usually a, a good sign for them that, oh, you have product market fit because some portion of your revenue is sticking around forever. So yeah, that would be my advice is and unfortunately, it's not very specific advice, but yeah, try to find out what they want and tell them that. Yeah, that's actually really specific enough. Let me back it up a little bit and answer this from another angle. What Justin just demonstrated is use a tool to get their attention. So if you can make it contextually relevant, there are other techniques that you can use, such as pay them a compliment. The first thing, hey, I really enjoyed your talk at this at TechCrunch Disrupt, or I really enjoyed your podcast that's what I respond to. When someone strokes my ego right in the first line, I actually open those a lot faster. The other thing you can do is if you can catch their attention, that first little preview line is so important and you can go so far with it. Imagine if I just said, I sent you a LinkedIn message or an email and it was all like hype. We're disrupting and transforming and revolutionizing the way. Get on board right now. While I'm checking out. The second thing is if you send me something that says, I hope you are doing well, ha ha ha, you know, type thing, I'm going to check out because I'm like, get to the point. You have to find what works for you and lead with your best thing. If you contact me and you said, hi, Ed, I hope you're doing well. I don't want to bother you. I know you're busy. And you used up all that preview space. I'm not interested. But if you contact me and said, I see that you're interested in this and we've got 25 million users on our platform. I'm going to go, okay, this says something a little different. You have to test and find out Justin's got a specific style that will work. Other people have another style that works. You just have to find your style. Yeah, actually, to give you some context or insight into what we're seeing is when we first started building this business in 2019, all of my reach out was like human health is going downhill. We need to fix that with sports. And VCs didn't care about that at all. So I stopped using it for a while, but then all of a sudden now in, in 2024, that's a hot topic. So it's now the main thing I lead with whenever I'm talking to them. So things will change, just stay on top of it. And let's say Justin has a Caitlin Clark moment, like the next summer Olympics when volleyball and something is like scandalous or happens or some celebrity rises out of the ashes, he could lead with that. So what Justin just demonstrated is that trends change and you can't use the same cookie cutter thing over and over again, pay attention, test, iterate. Great answer. Great question. Thanks for asking that. Thanks, Jen, for catching that for us. Justin, I'm going to give you the last word to you. You are a leader here at startups.com. One of our advisors. Appreciate your generosity. How can people contact you? How can people engage with you? What would you like to invite them to? LinkedIn is the best way to connect with me. Uh, Justin Ford, uh, Javelin Sports. I try to help founders as much as I can whenever I can, because again, I, I do have this kind of romantic view of the space. So <laughs> if you have any kind of questions or anything, reach out, can try my best to give you some insights. I, I have scaled up both B2B and B2C companies at this space, although my most current experience is B2C. So yeah, that's, that's what I'd say. Reach out if you have any questions. I'll love to chat. We will include all of Justin's contact information in the show notes below. On top of which, Justin, you generously help lead our B to C or consumer apps space in terms of the founder. So you do that once a month and all you have to do is just contact me and I'll connect you with Justin as well. If I think that you're going to be a good fit, we are here to help each other out. Justin, this has been great. I hope you come back and give us updates as things go, the new learnings, the cerebral skill set that you've got, I think founders could benefit from. Appreciate everything that you're doing. Jen, as always, thank you. Thanks to everyone who has been attending with us, ask those questions, as well as those who are going to be watching on the recording. We are here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Do the YouTube thing, like, comment, subscribe. Appreciate everybody. Justin, thanks again, and we'll see you in the next show. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Jen.